مساء الخير اهلا بيكو انا هبتدي بس بحاجه صغيره عن مركز التحرير الثقافي وانا هتكلم بالانجليزي ف اي ويل سويتش ناو تو تو انجلش سو سو ماي ماي توك از از ريتن هير كولد ار يو ان ارتست ريفلكشنز فروم ذا جاكاراندا تري هاويفر اي ام جونا ستارت باي جست جيفينج ا بريف intro about the place that we're in right now. Uh, it's called the American University in Cairo's Tahrir Cultural Center. And I'd just like to say a little bit about uh, the Cultural Center and the American University in Cairo, and also a little bit about this, um, this building that we're in, this, this wonderful campus here in Tahrir Square. Um, so, so the first thing I wanted to mention is that uh, this building is 150 years old. It was built by Khidiwi Ismail, a very important ruler of Egypt in the 19th century. He built it uh, for his son-in-law and his closest confidant, a guy called Ahmed Khairi Basha, who was um, ho- holding the education file. He was, he was running the, the education file. And um, he lived, Ahmed Khairi Basha used this palace as his office and as his home, Uh, for for many years, and then at one point, uh, this building was sold to a Greek businessman. The business uh, man's name was Genocles. The name is quite familiar to most people these days uh, because it's associated with wine. But at the time, in the 1880s uh, uh, and the 90s, 1890s, uh, Genocles was in the cigarette business, so he was exporting. Egyptian tobacco around the world, and Egyptian tobacco was a very, very well-known uh, commodity and a, and a really important product. And Khidiw Ismail loved kind of the European style of architecture. You're probably all familiar that he uh, established downtown Cairo here. It's called Khidival Cairo. And um, probably the palace at that point in time was more uh, along the lines of um, European Uh, architectural styles. It was Genocles who wanted to exotify a little bit and orientalize the uh, product that he was selling because it was Egyptian tobacco and he wanted to market it in, in the West as an exotic kind of oriental product. So he is the one who introduced what is called the Neo-Mamluk style to this palace. Uh, he, built, he built some additional parts of the palace. If you have a chance to walk around Um, you can see there's an area called the presidential staircase where you can see very clearly that neo-Mamluk style. And in fact, this room that we're in now is a continuation of that style. This room was built much later, uh, in 1932. But what you see here is kind of um, the same style, neo-Mamluk style, which refers back to the Mamluk style of architecture that you will see in certain parts of uh, old Cairo if you've ever visited some of the monuments and mosques there. Um, Just to continue briefly the history of the building uh, uh, before it became AUC, uh, its final stage was when Genocles, um, you know, stopped using it as a, as a cigarette factory and showroom, and uh, the building was then used by the founders of Cairo University. So this is a little, little known fact that uh, Gamat al-Qahira, Cairo University, was also founded here in this building and spent the first 10 years of its existence in this building before it moved to Giza, where it, where it currently is, of course, the biggest university in Egypt. Uh, but at the time, its name was the Egyptian National University, or El Gama al Masri al Qawmiya. Only afterwards did it change its name to Gama al Fouad al Awal, and then Cairo University that we all know now. So, it's, so, so I find it very interesting that, uh, that the building had several. Life, life cycles, even related to education, um, the, latest, the last one being the home of Cairo University, before it became AUC uh, in 1919. So, so it actually had, has 100 years of, of, of existence as AUC. Um, where is AUC now? AUC is in New Cairo. The main campus of AUC is in Tagamu uh, al-Khamis, fil Qahira Gidida. Uh, it left here around 2008, so um, this building for 10 years was kind of um, here, we, we used it, AUC used it for some of its big events occasionally, 
uh, because we have a wonderful hall called Ewart Hall and, and you know, we have this Oriental Hall, but mainly it was kind of not being used as much as it should have. Around 2019, there was a movement, uh, maybe it started a few er years earlier than that, to revive downtown Cairo. Um, there began, began to be a lot of interest in reviving downtown Cairo, and AUC um, really saw that it should play a big role because before AUC left, AUC was playing an important cultural role here in downtown Cairo. This campus was very, very active with a lot of lectures, concerts, theater performances, all of which emerged from AUC itself, professors, students, uh, the arts department. So with the revival of downtown Cairo over the last five years, AUC decided to transform this uh, campus into the Tahrir Cultural Center, and that brings me to the closing of the circle that I was uh, saying I was going to, um, you know, start this, con this talk by saying that um, for the last four years almost, we're going to be four years old in February 2023, this place has operated as the Tahrir Cultural Center, and um, if you've been here recently, you've probably seen that we do a lot of cultural uh, activities here. We have um, theater performances, movie screenings, art exhibits, and we're right in the heart currently of uh, a huge festival season. So for the last month and a half, much to the enjoyment of, uh, you know, the Cairo uh, downtown scene, uh, there has been um, festival after festival after festival. So we started in September with the Animatics Animation Festival. That immediately uh, yeah, this one gave, uh, you know, was enriching our campus with a lot of uh, talks and movies about animation. And then afterwards, there came a festival called She Arts, which was for, for five days all about women's empowerment in the arts. It was an amazing uh, experience. And then She Arts handed it over to the Hakawi Festival for Children's art, and that was an incredible, another uh, 10 days of uh, performances and activities. And then for the last week, we've actually been, it's a unique experience for us, we're, we're really excited that we did this. Uh, we're, we're actually involved in three festivals simultaneously for the last week, so we have the Art d'Egypte lecture series, of which this is the last one, uh, but they started on Friday. Uh, we also had the Downtown Contemporary Arts Festivals Arab Arts Focus. There were a hundred delegates from around the world discussing the future of the performing arts, and they were doing that here in Tahrir uh, Cultural Center. And then continuing through all this, and I hope you'll be able to attend something, there's the Cairo uh, Jazz Festival, and that's the third year that we have uh, that particular festival. It's a very exciting uh, nine days of performances from all around the world, and that's going to go on until Friday. We're going to take a small break after the Cairo Jazz Festival, and then we're going to have our last big festival of this season, which is going to be the Cairo International Film Festival. That's going to take place between November um, uh, 13th to the 22nd. And um, the main place where that festival takes place is, and that's Taban, the biggest festival of all uh, in Egypt. That takes place mainly in the Opera House grounds across the river. However, we are, for the second year in a row, the second... Uh, hub of that festival, so you will see here a lot of film screenings, premieres, workshops, master classes, other, other things including exhibitions uh, related to, to, to cinema, both Egyptian, international, and regional. So, so in many ways, I, I think what, uh, if you attended Montez's talk um, uh, about the importance of the art community coming together to uh, work together to uh, support the arts and not be competitors, I believe that this is kind of the role that we are trying to play here at AUC. We're trying to be a place where all of the arts can have a home and can really be, uh, because that's, that's, that's why this campus exists. I mean, this campus is right here in the center of town. It's got a lot of facilities, a lot of halls, beautiful gardens, and it's really the ideal place for that kind of um, community building in the arts to take place. So, so I think we're, we're somewhat on our way to doing that. And here, here I want to reflect, why is this talk called Reflections from the Jacaranda Tree? Because um, a year ago we, we launched a, a, a platform called Jacaranda, and we launched it through this uh, publication. 
which is called Jacaranda. Jacaranda is a tree. We have two of them uh, here on our campus. If you're familiar with the Jacaranda tree, it's, it's the beautiful tree that blooms once a year uh, in the spring, and, and its flowers are purple, and they, they kind of transform the whole landscape around it. These, these, fla these leaves are, or flowers are, are sort of when, when the leaves start to fall on the ground. Um, we launched this publication as a place to discuss uh, important issues in the arts. And um, for the introduction of this uh, 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 issue of Jacaranda, um, I, I, uh, I wrote something called um, When the Fools Come Down from the Hill. And, and that's what I want to talk about today. So, so my presentation today, which is Are You an Artist? Uh, reflections from the Jacaranda Tree, is actually, I'm just going to take you through, uh, hopefully very quickly, some thoughts that I have about the future of art and, um, and, and, and what, what does it mean to call yourself an artist. So, so the song that you heard uh, before, you, uh, before the presentation started was um, by the Beatles. It's a very well-known song called The Fool on the Hill. And... Um, that's kind of how I want to start the presentation. By uh, first, but before I start, I want to give a lot of credit to the artist who drew this, uh, these renditions of the Jacaranda. This is Tara Abdel Awi. Tara Abdel Awi is a is an AUC adjunct professor, but he's also a very well known artist, and he drew all these wonderful sort of um, almost psychedelic uh, versions of the Jacaranda, and we used it for our cover, and we used it on the inside cover. Um, they're really, really beautiful, and I think they really capture the essence of the jacaranda tree. So, to get to the, the, the idea of the fool on the hill and why, uh, why this talk is about, um, you know, this concept of the, the, when the fools all come down from the hill, this guy maybe has not much to do with art. He's a scientist. His name is Richard Fenton. He's well known for being a really important uh, scientist in the U.S., uh, one of the most important. He won the Nobel Prize. Um, and he also was part of the team that built the atomic bomb. Quite unfortunate, but scientists were being uh, used uh, a lot by, the, by, by governments to build things like the atomic bomb. There's something he said, though, uh, later in his career, in the 1970s, um, he said, and I'm going to quote from uh, Chakaranda here, he said that what we've been able to work out about nature may look abstract and threatening to someone who hasn't studied it, but it was fools who did it, and in the next generation, all the fools will understand it. So what he means by that, what he means by all the fools will understand it is that knowledge transfer moves very quickly. And even though, you know, a group of scientists like Richard Feynman, you know, brilliant scientists, did things over the course of the century that no one else could do because they were the only ones with the resources and, and the knowledge to do that kind of thing, what he believed very strongly was that he's not better than anybody else and that the knowledge that, that, that he developed would eventually reach everybody else and everybody would understand it. And I think probably if you think about the internet, for instance, um, you could probably realize that he's absolutely right. Because right now on the internet, every single person who has access to the internet can pretty much access every piece of knowledge that's been created since the beginning of time. So in many ways, the fools have already come down from the hill. Nobody can really claim now to have sort of a monopoly on knowledge. Knowledge is now accessible to everybody uh, at any time, just at the click of a, of a button. So I think his, his prediction um, came true. And, and I want to kind of argue that the same is the case for being an artist. I want to argue that, or I want to I present kind of as a thought, that whereas before um, you had to be sort of very special to be an artist, or you, um, you, know, you, you could only dream of being an artist if you were in a certain circumstance, I would like to argue that the future is going to be very different from that, and that actually art is going to be the, the, you know, sort of the thing that anybody can, anybody can practice, anybody can do if they really want to. 
And I know that's a little bit of a naive, maybe it sounds a little bit naive, and, and I know I'm not the first person to th- say that. A lot of people have said that before. A lot of people might have a lot of things to say about that, and that's why I want to go a little bit deeper into why I'm saying that and, and, and what I mean by it. So these two comments, anyone can be an artist, and everyone should be an artist. Are, are sort of the two thoughts that I, that I want to discuss with you guys. Um, first of all, can anyone be an artist? And second of all, should everyone be an artist? Are the two questions that I want to ask. And, and, and I believe that a, a very quick journey through Instagram, which everybody's familiar with, will reveal the following. That most artists were probably born in 60 minutes on Instagram than ever existed since the world began. Let's stop a minute at that, at that statement. Okay, so if you've ever scrolled on Instagram, and if you yourself are interested in art, the algorithm on Instagram kind of understands you. It begins to understand who you are, and it shows you things that, that are similar to you, that, that you have looked at in the past. So most likely, as, 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 as has happened to me, you may have noticed that a lot of people are identifying themselves on Instagram as artists. So their picture is there, and then it says, you know, a lot of people put a bio, you might say, you know, who they are, what age they are, but a lot of people say that they're artists. And maybe if you're skeptical, if you're a little bit tough, um, if you're professional, you will say, that guy's not an artist, <laughs> or she's not an artist, you know? You might look at the art that they present and be a little bit upset, if you're an artist especially. Some artists, at least. I'm not saying that all artists are like this. Or if you're a curator or, or maybe you've studied art, you might sort of look at those people and say, you know, no, that guy's not there yet, you know? He's, he's sort of... He's calling himself an artist, or he's calling, they're not an artist yet. However, I believe that... Um, What's actually happening is that a lot of these people are practicing something that comes naturally to to every human being, and that is artistic expression. I think it's inside every human being to want to express themselves, and thus to label themselves as an artist might just be something that they're doing for for a different reason. Maybe they think that someone's going to buy their art. Maybe they think they're going to get famous. Maybe it's an ego thing. But I think what, what they're all actually doing... From, from, from a deeper sense, is they are just doing what art's purpose may actually be, which is just as a form of expression, a form of personal expression. So what I believe is happening is that people are unleashing their creativity, and they're doing it on a massive scale that the world has never, ever seen before. And... When, when, I, when I say that, you know, in 60 seconds, or sorry, 60 minutes on Instagram, more artists are born than ever existed uh, in the history of the world, it's not an exaggeration. The number of artists are really, really increasing. And I think one of the reasons why they're increasing is because not only can people show other people that they're artists, but the tools to create the art are also readily available to everyone. If we're talking about contemporary art, for instance, if we're talking about art that's um, visual-based, that, that, that is sort of pho- photographic or video-based uh, or in, re- requires editing of videos, those tools are now accessible to every single person on their phone. So they don't even, they don't even have to go to a studio. They don't even have to get out of bed, you know, in the morning. They can actually create art. And, and, and again, it's a wide term, but... Um, but I think if you, if you look at a lot of the work and if you look at the tools that are available, if any of you have tried using reels on Instagram or stories on Instagram, you'll see that there are a lot of artist tools that are available for everybody to use and create art. The, the, the idea that, that they're creating art then feeds into a second idea, which is, okay, if you're creating art, do you need an ecosystem around you to help you develop that art? And here is where... I agree with those who are critical. 
Okay? Because if you're creating art in a vacuum, if nobody's actually talking to you about the art, if nobody's reacting to your art, if nobody is um, discussing your art, then maybe your art depends on who you are and, and how much you're dedicated to it. Maybe your art won't advance. Maybe your thought process won't advance. Mottez, in, the, in, the, in, the, in his brilliant talk uh, that preceded mine, um, discussed something called the Barzakh, and he showed his, his, his sculpture uh, that, uh, that showed last year at the pyramids and now is permanently displayed in, in New Giza. And he described in a very, very smart and interesting way how, how to, to reach that particular sculpture. It took him, I don't know, 40, 40 years? Because he said that the first idea started when he was a kid visiting the solar boat. So he said he was seven years old at the time. That's when he first saw the image that eventually became the Barzakh sculpture. But then over the last 10 years, he described several stations where um, the idea that he first had as a kid or the vision that he first had as a kid was developed further through interaction and mentoring and perhaps through his own study and research. And here I want to point to a way, and, 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 I, and I think that's the, that's the path that, that, that any artist who's serious about their art, and here I want to argue that anybody can be serious about their art. It's not only people who go to art school or, or, or you know, go to an art residency. Um, I mean, those are the ones we hear about, but, but I think anybody can go through this path of interaction, learning, feedback. And I think, again, the internet and this knowledge base that's been created provides us with those tools. And I want to point to something that maybe you guys have seen before. This is cave art. This is art that was created tens of thousands of years ago by people who didn't have Instagram, that didn't have art critics, that didn't have uh, art buyers, I mean, it, it kind of, I want to think back that when, when someone created this art a long time ago in a cave in France, did someone come up immediately and put a price tag on it, you know? Or did someone, did, did, did a critic say, you know, oh, you know, you need to work on that shading over there? Maybe, I don't know, it could be, it's possible. But the point is, we don't really know. But what we do know is that someone had an, an expression that they wanted to uh, put on a, on a physical space that other people then looked at and experienced. Today, we have things like this, niche. Has anybody heard of niche? So niche is a really famous site on Instagram. It's got millions of, of, of people following it. Every day on niche, there are posts, stories and posts, where well-known artists tell you about their artistic process. It's a brilliant site. It's a site that every artist, young, old, experienced, beginner, can benefit from. Because you will see that there are artists on that site who basically, whatever stage you're at in your artistic career, will help you just by reading what they themselves experienced. So you'll see some quotes from Pablo Picasso, you'll see some quotes from a famous director, you'll see some quotes from an artist you might have never heard of. But the thing is, all of those quotes, they're a knowledge base and they're a feedback loop for you as an artist. So a lot of artists actually depend on niche as a daily feedback loop. And again, they don't need to be in, uh, in art school. Um, it's kind of like its own art school. And I like this quote that I got from niche from Patti Smith, who's a very well-known uh, singer in the US and, and, and uh, musician. And she says basically that what makes an artist is imagination and the ability to transform. And again, we go back to the Barzakh, or what Matez was saying, and we see that he was saying that his, the last iteration of his sculpture was a, a sort of passageway where people have to go through this passageway in order to transform into something better, into something that fulfills their deeper ambitions or their dreams. And it's very similar to what Patti Smith is saying about what makes an artist. What makes an artist is their ability to actually transform their thoughts into something that for them reveals that their imagination is real and that it can move into something else. And that's available to everybody. You don't need to be special to do that. But you need to be sort of 
understanding the idea that, that you can be an artist, that you are an artist. So what happens when everybody becomes an artist? Because there's going to be a lot of artists. There already are a lot of artists. What happens to all of these unhangable paintings? There's going to be thousands of paintings, and there's not going to be enough galleries for them. What happens to all the unpublishable manuscripts? I mean, this is a reality. There used to be a system where all of this stuff was feed, fed into... Um, I mean, the system still exists, obviously. Um, in many ways, we call this system a system of gatekeepers. What's always happened is that there, there, there has always been individuals and institutions who serve as kind of the arbiters of what can be hung on galleries, what can be published, et cetera, et cetera, what can be shown as theater performances, what can be uh, you know, put in movie theaters, and all this kind of stuff. And the gatekeepers will always be there. They're not going away. They're always going to be there. And in fact, in times like these, when more artists want to enter, sometimes what the gatekeepers do is they make the gates even stronger. They raise those walls even higher so that, so that it's limited to, to a small number of people who can actually enter that domain called art. Uh, and that's fine. That's fine. But right now, what's happening is that the gatekeepers, for sure, are not going to be controlling it as much as they used to, no matter what. No matter how, no matter how they try, they will not be able to control it because um, the... You could compare it a little bit. I'm, I'm wearing this pin by, by a well-known Japanese artist, and it's got a wave on it. It's a very famous uh, part of a very famous painting uh, or series of paintings, yeah. Um, but what's going to happen with the gatekeepers, no matter how high they raise the gate, is that the wave of art that's appearing and that's going to appear and continue to appear, it's just going to crash right over the gate. There's no, there's no stopping this wave at all. So beware the gatekeepers, they're there, they're fine, listen to them sometimes, but they're not the end of the story anymore. And here I want to bring this up. This was the main image in the piece called When the Fools Come Down from the Hill. And these are not fools. I don't, I don't intend at all to, to, to be calling these uh, people fools. On the contrary, what I want to do is I want to point to this. It's called cr Cringet. Has anybody heard of Cringet? Okay, so crin Cringet is a, is a kind of a new thing that's happening. Um, it's probably happening all around the world, but, but this, this particular Cringet is happening in Egypt. And you can see that it's got a lot of followers. This, this screen grab from Cringet was taken uh, last night. So it's got 115,000 followers right now, Cringet. It started as a small thing, but it keeps getting bigger. And let's read what they've written about themselves. Talented, brilliant, incredible, amazing, show-stopping, spectacular, never the same, totally unique, completely not ever been done before. So what is Cringet? Cringet is an aggregator of, maybe you can call it artistic, some people would call it entertainment, and some people would call it a lot of other things. <laughs> but it is basically people who are practicing art in places you would never have expected it to be practiced. It's people who grabbed onto their phone, and they're on TikTok, or they're on Instagram, or they're wherever, and they are basically just doing some sort of performance or some sort of art. Again, you can call it art, you can not call it art, that's not my issue. But, but what they're doing, I think a lot of them consider what they're doing is art. And you've got you to gotta ask yourself a question. Why is it called cringet? So the expression to cringe means when you look at something like that and you're like, what is that? You know, and you kind of like are cringing against it. And there's something I learned from Nietzsche and from reading about art, which is that if you as an artist are afraid of people having that reaction to your art, if you're afraid of someone cringing when they see your art then maybe you still need to develop your art a little bit. Because actually, if you really want to be an artist and you want to develop, you need to get over what anybody thinks of your art. Your main thing is you need to feel that art inside of you and produce it no matter whether people are going to cringe or not cringe. So I believe that these cringet, and I don't know them personally, 
But uh, I think they're, what they're doing is very interesting. I think they're playing a double game with the cringette. I think they are kind of cringing at these people, and they're sort of asking their viewers to cringe at these people and say, who, who are these people? What are they doing? But at the same time, I think they are using that cringe in its double meaning, in its other meaning, which is that it doesn't matter if you cringe because these people actually believe in what they're producing. They believe in the art that they're producing. In any case, if you haven't seen Cringet, you have to see Cringet. Go in there, join it, and look at the stuff on Cringet and judge for yourself. And there's also now a lot of copycat sites that are exactly like Cringet that are aggregating from all of the platforms and, and choosing these kind of, um, you know, independent, let's say, uh, artists from all across Egypt, from everywhere in Egypt, who are producing this form of art or other forms of art. So, the last thing I want to point out is these words here, which are curation, classism, and the low art, high art debate. And I want to say that whatever we're talking about here, it's not new. Uh, this debate, where there are curators, people looking uh, at art from different uh, perspectives, some of which are financial, some of which are societal, some of which are political, this debate between low art and high art, what, cl what classifies as art that deserves to be seen, what, what classifies as art that is considered, you know, ruining the art scene, You've heard this debate. It's going on right now in Egypt regarding Musiqat uh, al-Maharaganat, um, But it's been going on forever. It's not new. It's the same debate that happened, um, and you may have heard this before, but uh, Abdel Halim was considered uh, too, uh, you know, modern at one point. Um, you know, and others throughout the history of art in Egypt and elsewhere. It's been going on, actually, for thousands of years. So these debates are going to continue happening. It doesn't matter. You know, they're interesting. And we tried in Jakaranda to, to, to cover some of those debates and some of, the, some of the topics we cover. But I just want to say that's happening whether, whether we, you know, care about it or not. And it's okay. It can keep happening. But meanwhile, what I think is going to happen is that because things are moving so fast, these types of people who everybody's heard of, who are brilliant artists, that was the Beatles. This is, of course, Omu Kulsum. And that's Beethoven. These are three of the biggest names in art in the last couple hundred centuries. And everybody knows them. And everybody will continue to know them. And if we sort of do surveys of people, depending on you know, their knowledge base or who they are, people will probably be able to name 10, 15, 20, 100, maybe even 1,000 artists through history. But I think that's going to end pretty soon. Because I think there will not be a chance for anybody in the future of art to reach the status of those three names and the other 10, 50, or 100, or 1,000 names. Why? Because there's just going to be too many people creating art, and the cycle in which people talk about their art, enjoy their art, you know, live their art, it's just going to be too many people and too short a time and you're not going to have these big names anymore because the name is going to be big for a week or a month or maybe a year, and then another name is going to replace them, and then a hundred names are going to replace them, and then a million names are going to replace them. And that's how it's going to be as we move forward. The era of like the, the lone, brilliant artist is probably nearing its conclusion, and it's going to be the era of everybody being an artist. And that's the last thought that I wanted to leave you with. Um, and, uh, and I'm looking forward if you have any uh, angry comments or you want to debate this um, I'm very very happy to uh, in encourage that kind of dialogue thank you very much Right, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I just want to know, uh, you've mentioned um, everyone can be an artist, right? And so why should everyone, uh, everyone be an artist? 
You haven't answered the question. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, I mean, that in the end goes back to everybody. But I, I, I think the only thing I can sort of answer that is an interesting conversation I had with a friend of mine. Um, we both like to take uh, photos and post them on Instagram. And both me and my friend, um, you know, we think that by taking these photographs, we're, we're sort of revealing some sort of artistic vision of something that we saw, okay? And... I have an Instagram account, but I don't have that many followers, and, and um, you know, I'll get like one or two likes on a photo, but but I don't I don't I don't really care to be honest with you. I mean, it'd be nice to get a lot of likes. It's a nice thing to get a lot of likes, but it's not the reason why I post the photos on Instagram. My friend, on the other hand, becomes very very upset if he doesn't get any likes on the photo. So I had a discussion with him. I said, "Why are you creating these photos? Are you creating them so that people can see them?" Are you creating them so that you can get the likes? Or are you creating them because you saw that moment and you, as an artist, thought that that was a moment that you wanted to capture in, an, in a piece of art? And that's the debate. There's no answer, but that's the, that's the debate that I'm suggesting. Yeah, of course. Thank you. like that that was the only question because that because that kind of sums it up um so if nobody has any other questions i'll leave you with uh this uh final thank you and a song to put you in the mood for hopefully the next uh phase of the world's artistic one two journey i just came over here to london to cool out with my man jazzy b in the solar soul posse i go by the name of bad five Freddy. i got something i want to say Check it out. Lay your cards on the table, place your bets. 